Hello, my name is Yasir Bell. Uh, today we're at Calvary Baptist Church. I'm a student at Rosa Parks, and we're here today for the 50th celebration of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. I have a question for you guys. Um, what do you think about Dr. King's words okay. today? What you need a chair. Dr. King's How many words today? Do we have at this table? I think that they had an impact on the black community today Thank because you, it hit so Thank close to home we, we, and it's we still fun. relevant to this day even so back then because okay. I think that America has come along Williams, but we still we have, have work to be done here. so that's my idea. Um, what words really stood out to you in his speech? Uh, of course you know I have a dream which is like the main phrase of the whole thing. I think it has like a powerful message and it shows that you know, he sees this vision for America in the future, and the vision is coming to be, but we still have a long way to go as well, so. Hi, my name is Jasir. I'm a student at Rosa Parks. Welcome to Calvary Baptist Church. And today I have a quick question for you. Is it okay if I ask? So, um, how does Dr. King's work affect you? Oh, um, it just allows me to realize how back in the day there was a lot of segregation and we were very separated. And now he, he kind of brought us together and allows most of the things that we have today. So that's just good. Thank you. Do you know that today is um, the Dr. King celebration? Yes, we know. And what does Dr. like, how do you think we are keeping his dream alive today? I think we're keeping his dream alive by giving him peace and freedom and equality. And how do you think? How do you think the words of Dr. King are being used today? The words of Dr. King? Yes. Um, by spreading you know, knowledge of uh, equality and peace and equal, equal rights for everyone. So, going back to what he said about equal rights, um, do you think that it's in effect today? I do believe that equal rights are in effect today. Um, one thing that Dr. King fought for were for um, people of all color to be able to go to the same schools and drink from the same water fountains, and today that is happening. Do you feel like his words are keeping everyone together today? Yes, because what he said back then, he said that he dreams that Four children will not be judged by the uh, color of the skin, but by the content of the character, and that is about what's happening today. Okay. Thank you. So, what do you think about Dr. King and his work? Like his I Have a Dream speech? Do you know anything about it? Do you know anything about Dr. King's I Have a Dream speech? Yeah. Do you know what he meant by like trying to get people together? So what I think um, Dr. King was trying to do, I think he was just trying to make sure that there was equality for all people so that nobody was, like not one specific person was counted out. Do you feel the words of Dr. King still affect us today? Yes. How do you feel it affects us? Because back in the day when he did his I Have a Dream speech, he, it was all about ending racial equality. And that's what he was trying to do to change. Hi, everyone. Welcome to Calvary Baptist Church. Um, my name is Jasir. I'm a student at Rosa Parks. And I just have one quick question for you. Um, how do you think uh, my, uh, how do you think Martin Luther King's word is still alive today? Well, it motivates a lot of black people. So us being black people and stepping forward and representing him, so I think that's how we're keeping his word alive today. Uh, what do the um, last few words in his speech, uh, free at last, free at last, thank God Almighty, I'm free at last, mean? I would like to free black people. Alright, thank you. Hello, welcome to Calvary Baptist Church. My name is Jasir. I'm a student at Rosa Parks, and I just have a quick question for you. Um, what do you think the words of Dr. King really mean to you? Uh, that's a question. I wasn't ready for a question. <laughs> I think that uh, it's like saying that for the black community, you're finally free at last. Like saying that you've tried to end racism. 
him and like it, he ended it somehow, right? But it's still around too. But he made a change. Thank you. How do you feel the words of Dr. King affect us today? The words of Dr. King affect us today by us utilizing unity, coming together as one, and embracing what he has established for us. Do you think the words of Dr. King still mean a lot to everyone today? Oh yes, definitely. We are continuing to follow his footsteps. It means so much, even more today than it did then when he announced it, but it opened the door to show a path that we would continue to progress and be able to make sure that our, our children will be able to follow a man of great uh, residence and being able to be leaders just like he was when he, we were coming up. So yes, Dr. King means everything. Thank you. Okay. Hello, Mrs. Lai. Good morning. How do you think Dr. King's words affect us today? Oh, come on. Uh, they, if only people believed in what he said and what he did, they, if they affect us in the mere fact that he was prophetic in what he said. He knew that there would be racism, and it still exists. It still exists. He put the cry out for us to come together as people and we are still trying to come together as people. Um, if people understood what it meant when he said he's been to the mountaintop, if he said when he talked his whole I have a dream speech, his dream still has not come to fruition. And I'm gonna make this a political statement right now. As long as number 45 is in the White House, we're still gonna fight that battle. And does Dr. King's words affect you personally? If Absolutely. so, how? Mm -hmm. Absolutely, they affect me personally because I remember him. Um, for, he was a real person in my life. It was more than the I Have a Dream speech. The I Have a Dream speech was just one of the small portions of what he said and what he stood for. The letters that he wrote, uh, he was always on the march of trying to make people equal, the march for equality, the march to break down discrimination. Um, he was always on that march. And that is something that we have to attend to today. We cannot just assume that because we have President Obama in the White House that we have reached our place in America. President Obama in the White House was a great mark for us, something that brought tears to my eyes when we found out that he was going to be our president. Um, so it affects me in that we managed to do that as a people. We cannot allow that to disappear from us. We've got to keep moving on and fighting on and reaching back and pulling others along with us. Okay. Um, in the. Okay. Oh. 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 Oh.
Every day you can ask someone who sings in the Metropolitan Opera House to make your announcement, right? <laughs> but young people get to know people. <laughs> Mrs. Mr. Martin, Joseph Martin, thank you for coming and being with us. You talent to celebrate Dr. Martin today. God bless you too. Dr. Randall Lassiter, pastor of Historic Calvary Baptist Church. Lady K, dignitaries, other clergies, deacons, deaconess, Calvary family, friends, community members, and especially the student honorees. Today, we would like to share with you, speaking through the eyes of Coretta Scott King, the wife of the late Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., how she became a quite icon in history. Yes, I am the wife of Congressman John Lewis, the Lil Lillian Miles Lewis. What do you know about me? <laughs> Nothing, I bet. Well, I am a native of Los Angeles, California. Also, I am a librarian at Atlanta University. It was there that I was introduced by a friend at, New Year's, at a New Year's Eve party in 1967, where they introduced me to John Lewis. And less than one year later, John and I were married and settled in Atlanta, Georgia. I remember when marrying John Lewis. It was such a sweet, sweet time in my life. 
However, my best friend said to me, you are so dumb going into this marriage and you don't even know how much money he earns. I'm sure glad I did not listen to that, sister. <laughs> my contributions were many to the success of my John Lewis, such as, one, I wrote many of his speeches you have heard and hear today from John. Two, I call most of his meetings to order, arranging strategic, strategically his calendar. Little did I know that he would be heading to Washington, D.C. as a congressperson where he, is, where he serves today in 2020. We were married between 1968 and 2012. John was instrumental in organization, student sitting, organizing student sittings, bus boycotts, and nonviolent protests in the fights for voters and racial equality. Four, he was one of the 13 original freedom writers, led the march on Washington, D.C., and the march across the Edmund Peters Bridge in 1965 to Selma to Montgomery marches. Remember, we must, be, we must be the change as young and mature people in order to have a purposeful life. Thank you. Next, we will hear from Ms. Juanita Abney, the dynamic former First Lady, Ms. Rowe, and then we will hear from Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. himself. Let's give them a resounding round of applause. Hello, everyone. Hello. My name is Juanita Abernathy, wife of Dr. Ralph Abernathy, Martin's closest friend. Next to Coretta, I was the second wife to work with our husbands in the struggle to end segregation and to secure the vote. I organized the march and campaign for voting, rights for African Americans to integrate schools in 1950s and 60s. It was my job to type and organize flyers requesting people not to ride the buses during the boy bus, boy, the bus boycott, taught voter education classes, housed, housed freedom riders, and marched with my husband in 1963, marched on Washington for jobs into the Selma to Montgomery, Alabama in 1965. The boycott lasted for 13 months. It was at my kitchen table that the strategies and planning was done. Yes, I had to prepare and cook for those 13 months for Dr. King, Dr. Abernathy, and the other civil activists, which led to the landmark Supreme Court decision in 1956. It will take months to tell you my story. Thank you. Good afternoon. Who am I? If you're having difficulties identifying me, I am no stranger to this church and its community. I am the dashing, intelligent, phenomenal woman, right. glamorous wife of the late Reverend Dr. Albert Prince Rowe. Mm -hmm. <laughs> as, as a contemporary civil rights activist, I supported all of his missions Matter of fact, his mission and vision was 100% coined by us. If you want to read about my husband and I, please visit Patterson Museum, located in Patterson, New Jersey, where his legacy is displayed. You see, my husband was a mover and a shaker. <laughs> However, I am really due with respect the kingmaker. <laughs> As one of his favorite sayings, I love you and there's nothing you can do about it. <laughs> Well, I must confess, my heart Albert would just give all of his money to the, way, to the unfortunate brothers and sisters. Who am I? I am Dr. Dorothy Collins Rowe, wife of the man who gave all of his people, and especially Calvary Baptist Church, under the same banner as Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. He made a tremendous impact in Patterson, New Jersey, in areas of government, education, political arena, and most of all, serving serving man through community. Oh, how I miss my loving Morgan Bear. Thank you. Good morning, Calvary. Good morning. My name is Joel Lassiter, known to history as Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Right. Pastor Lassiter, Lady K, 
deacons, deaconess, members of the historic Calvary Baptist Church community at large, and especially to the trustees of this great institution. Trustees, thank you for finding not robbery and unbecoming of sharing the world stage with my wife, best friend, mother, and most of all, the one who knows our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Yes. Ladies, gentlemen, young people, I give you my Coretta Scott King, who will speak and share her experiences through the eyes of her own. See, often history has an interesting way of documenting and sharing the role, support, dedication, and loyalty of our spouses. So I now give to you the exhilarating, inspirational, supportive Coretta Scott King, the one and only one who stayed beside me through it all. Let's give her a round of applause. My dear, thank you for that heartfelt introduction. Good afternoon. As protocols have been established, I greet you in the name of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Yes, I am so pleased to have been summoned today, joining you in what will go down as in the history of the historic Calvary Baptist Church as one of its greatest moments in January 2020. First, let me acknowledge these dynamic and fabulous trustees who, in my opinion, is one of the greater support systems in this church and its community. My goodness, this place of celebration is just gorgeous. And thank you, Ms. Muckle and the decorate, Decoration Committee. Let's give them a round of applause. Thank you. Back to the color thing. Martin knows all my favorite colors are pink and green. However, however, <laughs> I love all colors because they make a beautiful rainbow. To my husband, Martin and brothers of black and old gold. We salute you, my dear. Who am I? I am the classy, magnificent, gorgeous, and dedicated wife of Dr. Martin yes. Luther King Jr. Yes, yes, yes. 51 years after the assassination of Martin, the world continues to search for peace and equal rights. But over the course of his life, Martin helped lead the charge. I was always by his side, either physically or in spirit. Our love story really began when a mutual friend, Mary Powell, played a matchmaker, sliding Martin my phone number. During our first phone call, Martin asked if he could meet me in person. Despite the dressed in black suit and boring image of a Southern Baptist preacher, I told him anyway that he could pick me up for lunch. Well, ladies, I would not exactly say love at first sight. In my book, My Life, My Love, My Legacy, I talked about when Martin pulled in his green Chevy that cold Thursday in January. My first thoughts reaffirmed what I had anticipated. He was too short, and he did not look that impressive. And on top of that, he was not sporting his normal mustache. He shaved it during his fraternity pledge process into Alpha Phi Alpha Fraternity Incorporation, so he looked quite young. Not long into the date, my view of him changed completely. I felt he was a man of substance, not like I had envisioned. Matter of fact, the longer we talked, the taller he grew in stature, and the more mature he became in my eyes. As we drove home, he kind of burst my bubble. He said to me that I was everything he wanted in a wife, character, intelligence, personality, and beauty. The following Saturday, Martin took me to a party. It was very clear nearly every woman in the place swooned over Martin, and at that moment, I was even more impressed by him. For someone only five foot seven and 22 years old, his personality was such that all the girls seemed to look up to him. Well, he brought up marriage again that night. As we settled in a courtship, I started regretting my initial assessment of Martin. So I concluded that there was no question. He was compassionate, held deep moral convictions, and sincere, sincerely wanted to change the conditions of the less fortunate people. Even as educated and talented as I was, I was nervous to meet his parents. After meeting Martin's parents, I was uncertain of where our relationship stood. 
One evening, Daddy King, Martin's father, droned on and on about the beautiful woman Martin had dated in Atlanta. However, I stood up and let Gaddy King know that I have something to offer Gray too. Would you believe Daddy King continued talking about Martin's prospects? Ooh, I thought Martin would not have said anything. Well, he stood up from the table and went into the other room and told Mama King, Coretta is going to be my wife. Two dinners later, Daddy King affirmed and said, you two are courting hard. It is the best that you get married. There it was, I got you now. <laughs> On June 18, 1953, 16 months after we met, we were married. Daddy King officiated the wedding at my parents' lawn in Marion, Alabama. I must admit that I was uncertain about committing to marriage so soon because I loved my independence and had planned to continue my career as a performer. Yes, ladies, I had to maintain my level of autonomy that was unconventional for times. It was displayed at my wedding when I made up my mind that I wanted the traditional language about obeying and submitting to my husband deleted from our marriage vows. The language made me feel too much like an indentured servant. Of course, Daddy King surprised me by not objecting to my choice. Hallelujah! Our wedding night was somewhat unconventional as it was spent in the home of a friend who was an undertaker. That's a funeral home. Of course, this was not my choice for a night after a marriage. The South had no hotel accommodations for black people during this time. Martin often joked about it, saying, Honey, do you remember when we spent our honeymoon at a funeral parlor? Let me establish a frame of reference. I was more than Martin's wife. As a child born in April 27, April 27, 1927, in Marion, Alabama, yes, I graduated valedictorian from Lincoln High School attend Antioch College with a degree in music and education in Yellow Spring, Ohio. Now down to some facts. Little was not known, my meeting Martin in college was a challenge for me in many ways. You see, Martin was given the title of having a Napoleon complex. However, that did not bother me the least. Of course, I lamented on the notion of often being seen but not heard. I was admired but not considered in my own but an activist substance. I have you know, they made, they made it sounded as if I were the attachment to the vacuum cleaner. However, I became the wife of Martin, then the widow of Martin, of all which I was proud to be. Another point that Martin recognized very well as we met, that I was more politically active than he was at that time. However, I was worried about how circumscribed my life would become if I married a pastor. It was known that part of the attraction between Martin and I was political, as letters between the two of us revealed we were, we were coding, as they would call it during those days. What really sealed the relationship was when I sent him a copy of the novel, Looking Backward, by Edward Bellamy, with a note saying, I shall be interested to know your reaction to Bellamy's predictions about the future. In September 1954, we moved to Montgomery, where Martin received his first pastorship at the Dexter A. Baptist Church. <coughs> yes, it was in Montgomery, where Martin's civil rights commitment first caught national attention when he emerged as the young leader and spokesperson before Montgomery bus boycott. Again, little did you know that I played a decisive role in this awesome challenge. Seven weeks to stand with Martin. Into the boycott house, my house was bombed. My 10 weeks old daughter, Yolanda, and I were home at the time, but we escaped uninjured. My friends, this was the turning moment of, in the life of my family. Terrified by this violence, both my fathers and, of Martin and I traveled to Montgomery to pressure us to leave with our baby Yolanda. This was a defining moment for us. I told our parents that I was not leaving. Whether history told or gave due credit or not, in this moment, the trajectory of the boy bus cot could have gone another way. This was a very trying time, and everyone seemed frightened. I realized how important it was for me to stand with Martin. The next morning at breakfast, Martin said, Coretta, you have been a real soldier, my rock in times of needs. You were the only one who stood with me. Had I flinched in a moment, the trajectory of the, boy, the bus boycott and the emerging civil rights movement might be difficult for all of you today. In other words, it very easily could have been no boycott. Can you imagine that? 
Little that one might know, while the Montgomery bus boycott was customarily seen at the advent of Martin's leadership, it was me who was vital to it emerging. During that time, I was tested by fire and came to understand that I was not a breakable crystal figurine. I found that often I had to answer haters stronger in a crisis. See, during the boycott, the phone rang incessantly with hate calls night and day. It was me who had to tell the caller that my husband told me to write the name and number of anyone who called to threaten his life so that he could return the call and receive the threat in the morning when he wakes up. Yes, again, it was I who spoke earlier than Martin and more forcefully against any American involvement in Vietnam than my husband did. My peace activism included a global vision, and in many ways, my commitment to global peacemaking helped inspire Martin's mission. In 1957, I was one of the founders of the Committee for Sane Nuclear Policy. My, I heard that we are hearing about this from 45 now. Oops. It was my speech that drew attention of Mahatma Gandhi and from the Underground Railroad, proving that the so-called silent generation is not silent. In 1959, Gandhi invited my husband and me to a five-week session to learn from her work, which led to meeting India's Prime Minister, Jawaharlal Nehru. With four kids at home, I had women's roles to contend with, with and Martin's contradictory beliefs. I was also forced to scale back my scene. However, I continued benefit concerts for the moment. I had to make it very clear that I loved being his wife and mother of our children. However, if that was all I did, it would have driven me out of my mind. I knew there was a calling for my life from a child. As a public speaker, too, I remained steadfast in my opposition to the Vietnam War. Did you know that I was the only woman who spoke at the Riverside Church to address an anti-war rally in the New York Madison Square Garden? It was amazing. The reporter asked um, Martin, following my speech in D.C.'s peace rally, whether he had educated me on the issues around the rally. Martin replied, she educated me. <laughs> so today, I conclude my favorite sayings. Hate is too great a burden to bear. It injures the hater more than it injures the hated. Young people, if the soul of the nation is to be saved, I believe that we must become its soul because the struggle is a never-ending process. Freedom is never really won. You must earn it and win it in every generation. I leave these words in a modified version recognizing the gap. Let the education ring in the streets of the inner cities and world at large where drugs have become the shackles on our minds. Let education ring in the jails where 60% plus or more of my brothers and sisters are housed and imprisoned with excellent minds. So when this happens, we will be able to speed up that day when all of God's children, black, white, Jews, Gentiles, Protestants, and Catholics will be able to join hands and sing in the words of our old Negro spiritual, free at last, free at last. Thank God Almighty, we are free at last. Thank you. historic Calvary Baptist Church, Martin Luther King celebration, and the message that I want to convey is that with all the modern technology that we have, be it cell phone, emails, uh, Netflix, you name it, we need to make sure that we get the message out of Dr. King and never let the message die. The dream is alive and well.